Here's what some of the older skyscraper proposals looked like 100 years ago. Here's what they looked like 50 years ago. Here's what they looked like 30 years ago. And here's what they looked like today. Do you notice anything different? Biophilic design is a concept that seeks to integrate natural elements into the built environment and has an aura of environmental sustainability. These green buildings, their lush vertical gardens and leafy balconies, promise not just to beautify their urban environments, but really look like beacons of hope in concrete jungles, promising cleaner air, reduced urban heat islands, and an enhanced connection with nature amid the steel and glass cityscapes. But I am here to argue that all of these these tree covered skyscrapers are not necessarily as green as they appear to be. Let's peel back all these green layers to reveal the environmental, structural, and practical challenges. And let's answer the question Does more visible green equate greater sustainability in architectural design? The concept of biophilia, the inherent human affinity for nature, has deep roots that trace back to our evolutionary history. Long before the term was coined, societies across the globe have intuitively harmonized their built environment with nature. Ancient hanging gardens of Babylon and traditional Japanese tea houses feature subtle interplays between architecture and nature, which reflect early manifestations of biophilia in human history. It was not until 1984 that the theory of biophilia was articulated by Harvard biologist E.O. Wilson in his book aptly titled Biophilia. Wilson's hypothesis argued for a genetically based human need to affiliate with life and lifelike processes due to our extensive evolutionary history. This theory sparked new ways of perceiving the relationship between humans and their environment, catalyzing a paradigm shift in architectural design. Architects like Qian Yun began to pioneer ecological design. Yun, known as the father of bioclimatic skyscrapers, led the charge in creating buildings that functioned as self-containing ecosystems systems using aesthetics with environmental strategies. By the early 2010s, the concept of biophilic design had well and truly been entered into the mainstream architectural landscape. Projects like the Bosco Verticale, located in Milan, that was completed in 2014, captivated the world's attention with their breathtaking vertical form. In contemporary society, our increased urbanization and reliance on technology have furthered the divide between human beings and the natural world, leading to what has been termed the nature deficit disorder. This disconnect not only impacts our physical health, but has profound implications on our psychological well-being. According to a study published in Science Direct in 2021, incorporating biophilic designs in office settings through various sensory elements beyond just the visual can significantly enhance human well-being. A publication in Springer in 2018 discussed the human-nature relationship, emphasizing the restorative of benefits nature has on health, well-being, and cognitive function. I'm also going to pop in here and just say I launched a podcast and you guys should check it out. All right, back to the video. The popular notion that greenery equates sustainability has gained substantial traction in both consumer preferences and development trends. This belief is partly founded on the apparent benefits of plant life in urban settings. Plants absorb carbon dioxide, provide oxygen, and create microclimates that can cool cities, thus reducing the urban heat island effect. A study from the University of Manchester suggests that green roofs can also reduce heat islands as much as 4 degrees Celsius. However, there is a nuanced disconnect between green aesthetics and the broader or comprehensive concept of sustainability. So for context, urban areas are substantial contributors to global CO2 emissions, despite occupying a relatively small fraction of Earth's land surface. The population of urban versus rural areas greatly impact this statistic. As of 2018, 55% of the world's population lives in urban environments, a proportion that is expected to increase to 68% 
by 2050. Urban areas are typically more densely populated, resulting in higher energy use, transportation needs, and greater waste generation per unit area than the rural setting, thus contributing disproportionately to emissions. Urban areas typically feel less connected to nature, leading to a strong desire to support these green vertical structures. So what makes architecture sustainable? Sustainability in architecture encompasses not just the integration of plants, but also considerations like building materials, energy use, water management, and long-term operational efficiency. Aesthetic choices, while being visually appealing, can sometimes overshadow these aspects of functional sustainability. So for instance, the use of green walls and rooftop gardens may have a feel-good appeal, but without proper ecological integration, such features can consume excessive amounts of water and energy. I can't tell you how many architectural reviews I've been on where students, myself included, will just slap on a green roof and vertical garden onto their concrete structure. This brings into question, do these lush designs minimize environmental impact so that the investment is worth it. This eco-consciousness fuels market demand and can lead developers to focus on green aesthetics as a sales strategy, sometimes at the expense of deeper, more sustainable initiatives. This market dynamic leads to a phenomenon known as greenwashing, where ecological benefits are overstated, leaving more substantial sustainable initiatives unaddressed. I have a whole statistics video here too that you can check out. In contemporary architectural rendering, like we talked about at the beginning of the video, the inclusion of lush vegetation in architecture sometimes serves as a more superficial gesture rather than a holistic approach to sustainability. Generally speaking, some architecture firms really prioritize this aesthetic overlooking crucial sustainable aspects. It creates this misleading perception of sustainability. So let's debunk the green facade. First and foremost, the underlying cost of maintaining such living ecosystems is substantial, especially when concerning water use. Statistics have shown that vertical gardens utilize a lot more water, often surpassing the water use in traditional ground irrigation. This brings into question its suitability in water scarce regions. So for instance, the Caxia Forum in Madrid is a vertical garden which spans over 24 meters in height and covering 460 square meters with approximately 15,000 plants. Reports suggest that supporting this vertical garden in densely packed plants requires constant irrigation, potentially amounting to hundreds of liters of water daily, depending on the season. This case underscores the challenge of sustaining vertical gardens in less water abundant environments. From a structural standpoint, tree covered skyscrapers necessitate a considerable resource expenditure beyond what meets the eye. They require a specialized framework in order to support the added weight of the garden, along with supporting how complex the root system and how deep that root system can get. This in turn translates to greater material usage and subsequently more embodied energy during the construction phase. Maintenance of the vertical forest also introduces safety hazards and associated costs can be exponentially higher than compared to just maintaining traditional gardens. One should also consider the broader environmental Environmental implications of these high-rise ecosystems. Tree-covered skyscrapers demand substantial energy from the construction and long-term maintenance of their green facades, which can eclipse the energy saved throughout their proposed insulation benefits. Furthermore, they can affect local biodiversity by introducing non-native species or by monopolizing areas that might have otherwise been supported a wider variety of life. In practice, some of these green structures may underperform against their projected energy models. By not meeting these expectations, they serve as a caveat that creating a green skyscraper goes far beyond just introducing vertical gardens. Let's talk about the Bosco Vertical in more detail. It's located in Milan, Italy, and indeed pushed the boundaries of architecture. The building was commissioned by the developer Heinz and was designed by Stefano Boeri. The towers were completed in 2014 and have since become a landmark. This project incorporates over 900 trees along with thousands of plants and shrubs along its facade. The trees and plants integrated into Bosco Verticale are estimated to absorb over 30 tons of CO2 annually. This 
This significant contribution to air purification underscores the building's role in mitigating urban pollution. It also hosts over 20 species of birds and attracts multiple species of insects to this region. The structural design of Bosco Verticale also had to account for the significant additional weight of both the trees and the soil needed. The trees were chosen carefully for durability and adaptability concerns, and they vary in height up to about nine meters, which is 30 feet. To accommodate this, the engineering team had to integrate a robust reinforcement to the building structure. According to Boeri's firm, considerable efforts in engineering were undertaken to ensure that the towers could handle this load. With each tower supporting the equivalent green surface of about 30,000 square meters of forest, the structure has to consider the dynamic forces associated with trees, including their root systems, the added complexity of wind forces acting on vegetation. By beefing up the structure, consider the admissions of additional material usage, production, transportation, and the whole construction process itself. There were also concerns vocalized by adapting the trees to the high-rise environment and their long-term vitality. The selected species had to undergo testing in wind tunnels to simulate the conditions that they would face at various heights. Despite these precautions, after the completion of the towers, reports suggested difficulties with the tree's adaptation necessitating ongoing maintenance and, and replacement. Also per year, it's estimated that each tree has to have about 2,000 liters of water during their initial years of growth. This once again highlights that potential strain, um, especially if it's a water scarce area. Now the challenges were not only engineering or physical related. There were also certain biological complexities in creating the sustainable living environment. The maintenance on the facade really involves a team of botanists who regularly inspect the plants, the species, the trees. Issues such as soil erosion, plant stress undermine the viability of all of these installations over time. More importantly, Bosco Verticale may be celebrated for its green features, but they can distract from more significant environmental challenges. Hey guys, have to pause here because apparently I muted myself. So sorry about that. And I figured you wouldn't want the audio to sound like this for the rest of the video. Of the building, it's important to... Yeah, probably not. So while vertical gardens may enhance urban biodiversity to some extent, their impact is often limited compared to natural ecosystems. The species diversity supported by vertical gardens tends to be less than what is found in natural forests, potentially reducing their effectiveness in supporting local ecosystems. And while vegetation can help cool urban environments, it's important to measure whether the cooling effect of plants significantly counters the heat generated by this additional water usage, maintenance, and the building itself. While Bosco Verticale represents an innovative design concept, its success relies heavily on the rigorous engineering and biological research to create a truly livable urban environment that seamlessly integrates nature. While visually stunning, this project has definitely sparked a trend where architects may prioritize superficial green features without thoroughly analyzing the sustainability of their proposals. To clarify, I am not bashing on this project, but more so the trend that this project has caused. Instead of deeply considering the environmental impact, some architects may simply add trees as a superficial gesture, neglecting this holistic approach needed for truly sustainable architecture. Numerous case studies highlight sustainability challenges like the treehouse in Singapore. For the treehouse, despite its vertical garden design, it falls short on energy efficiency. Problem like insufficient sunlight in living areas and the high energy demand for maintaining vegetation have undermined its overall energy performance. One central park in Sydney, Australia also features lush vertical gardens. However, studies have shown that the building's energy performance have fallen short of expectations. The greenery, while aesthetically pleasing, has not provided the anticipated insulation benefits and the extensive irrigation and maintenance required for the gardens have added significant energy consumption. So where do we go from here? How do we spin this into a positive video? It's essential for architects and designers to adopt a comprehensive approach to sustainability that considers all aspects of building design and construction beyond just the visual representation of greenery in renders. First and foremost, we need to consider the site, choose locations that have minimal ecological 
ecological value to avoid displacing natural habitats. We can also start talking about energy efficiency. Passive design strategies have been talked about for years, for decades. So incorporate design elements that enhance natural ventilation, optimal daylight use, thermal comfort without relying on these mechanical systems. Integrate solar panels, wind turbines, geothermal energy systems to supply the building's energy with sustainable sources. There's energy modeling softwares out, which are advanced tools used to simulate the energy performance. And we can therefore design and change the design for energy conservation. Think about water usage. We talked about water a lot in this video. So rainwater harvesting is a great system to implement that can collect water for irrigation and non-potable uses. Work with landscape designers who are very great at integrating water efficient landscaping. Materials, we talked about materials very briefly, but sustainable materials with low embodied energy should be prioritized. Materials that are locally sourced, recyclable, sustainably harvested should be a huge consideration. Consider the construction waste aspect of it all. Plan for the reduction, reuse and recycling of construction waste. I mean, the list can really go on and on like thinking about about indoor environmental quality, the longevity and flexibility in the design stages that allows for adaptive reuse decades later, biodiversity preservation, landscape for wildlife and design, spaces that support local flora and fauna, promoting ecological balance. I also think performing simple life cycle assessments on every building should be a standard practice. I know that that's not necessarily the case. I I've worked in many firms and I actually find it rare when people do um, commit to doing a life cycle assessment. Basically just evaluate the environmental impacts of materials and designs over the entire life cycle, aiming to minimize their ecological footprint. Adopting these strategies can lead architects and designers to produce buildings that are not only environmentally responsible, but also economically viable and incredibly beneficial to their occupants and their well-being. It's essential to view sustainability as a comprehensive, multi-dimensional approach that influences every decision in the design and construction process. As we move forward, we need to address the urgent challenges posed by climate change and resource depletion. By implementing a robust sustainability standard, we can pave the way for more sustainable and resilient built environment that minimizes its environmental footprint and contributes to an actually greener, healthier future. If you liked this video, please be sure to check out Ugh, I can't get our lips to match up. Okay, if you liked this video, please be sure to check out my climate change statistics and happy Earth Day, everyone.